By the time someone is in college, they should have already been taught basic information literacy to the extent that they can write a properly researched essay using reliable formal sources. Once they're at university, they should start becoming familiar with academic level sources and the scholarly research process. However, in my time as a university research assistant and later as an associate lecturer, I've come across many students, even at master's level, who simply didn't have this knowledge. I've found myself teaching students how to use a citation index, how to assess journals for quality, and how to carry out academic research. This video provides an introduction to assessing and researching scholarly literature. Publication authority hierarchy. It's so rare to see YouTubers these days cite any sources at all, let alone scholarly sources, that when you see it done, you're a lot more likely to take the YouTuber's claims seriously without even checking the validity of the source or verifying if it has been cited correctly. However, even if it has been cited correctly, not all sources are equal and not even all scholarly sources are of the same quality. Research on academic topics, whether in humanities or the STEM fields, consists of a series of activities starting with the least formal, least validated and least authoritative sources and ending in the most formal, well validated and most authoritative sources. We need to understand this hierarchy before conducting research in any field. On screen now is an image depicting the academic research and publication cycle. To understand the authority hierarchy, we'll look at the right hand side of this image, which is highlighted in green, and start at the top, at the 12 o'clock position. Here we find the term laboratory notebooks. These are produced during the earliest stages of original research and represent raw data collected through information gathering processes. This data has yet to be synthesized and analyzed and may not even be validated yet. Consequently, you typically won't ever see these records as a researcher. What you will see is the analysis and conclusions drawn from this data once the original researcher has assessed it and reported it in a publication of some kind. The next step at about the two o'clock position on our image is non-formal communication. This is when the original researcher starts to discuss their raw data with their scholarly peers in the form of memoranda, which are informal notes communicating information in brief, departmental colloquia, which are informal discussions of scholarly findings, and correspondence in the form of written documents or emails. Collectively, these forms of non-formal scholarly communication are known as the invisible college, since they consist of a process of reading an assessment of original research findings, which produces much peer discussion and informal analysis, but no formal published works, and is virtually unseen outside the immediate academic community in which it takes place. We can think of this as a kind of informal peer review, as original researchers discuss their findings with their peers and may subsequently return to the research process to revise their hypotheses, refine their information gathering methods, or even change their research topic. During the late Renaissance, and particularly during the scientific revolution of the 17th century, much of the scientific research taking place was communicated within the Invisible College, and the term itself is believed to have been coined at that time by the scientist Robert Boyle. The next step, at the three o'clock position on our image, consists of preliminary communication, when researchers inform professional publications of their original findings or other scholarly work. At this point, the researchers are not yet ready to publish their work, which is still being synthesized and analyzed. However, at this point, they have sufficient confidence in their work to start communicating portions of it outside the Invisible College when they feel it can make a useful contribution to scholarly discourse. Preliminary communication typically takes the form of fairly brief letters to scholarly journals, either directly to the editor or in response to articles which have been published in journals. We can consider this correspondence to be formal since it will be reviewed by the editor prior to publication, but at this stage it is only reviewed for clarity, relevance and usefulness. This is not a formal peer review process since the information provided is brief, 
it is presented in letter format rather than as a scholarly journal article, and there is no rigorous scrutiny of the researcher's hypothesis, methodology, results, and conclusions. However, this does start to release the researcher's work into the wild, where other scholars may take interest in it and discuss it through their own correspondence with the journal or researcher. This is the point at which you may encounter a researcher's work for the first time, and it's very important to know that letters such as these are not reliable research sources for the subject of your own research. They can be useful guides to the current literature or trends in the field, and you can include them in your information collection process, and you can even cite them as information sources in your own research. But they haven't been peer-reviewed, and you can't be certain of their accuracy or the validity of their original content. I wouldn't rely on original research mentioned in a letter like this to try and support a point in my own research. Later, we'll look at other forms of published scholarly communication which are similar to this, and which you can also cite with caution. The next step is the formalization of the researcher's work. On our image, this occupies the area from the four o'clock position to the six o'clock position. Formalization takes place through various processes of increasing rigor and professional scrutiny, and it's at this point you can start citing research with more confidence, though still with caution, for reasons I'll explain. At the low end are biosequence data and patents. Biosequence data refers to information about the specific order of certain kinds of genetic information, such as a DNA fragment or protein. Collections of biosequence data are very useful to scientists studying certain fields, and a great deal of biosequence data is published via open access, meaning it is made available freely and publicly for use by anyone, typically online, sometimes in articles and other times in databases. Biosequence data in open access journal articles or on websites, such as blogs, may not have been peer-reviewed and consequently may not be entirely reliable you should check the status of the source in which you find it to be certain. Patents emerge when a researcher finds something in their work they believe is a unique intellectual contribution of economic value, which they therefore wish to protect legally. Patents must meet specific criteria, such as being original, within the established range of patent subject matter, useful at least in theory, and non-obvious. But although they need to be theoretically practical, such that the invention can be built to perform a specific task, they don't need to prove the invention will work well, though it should represent an improvement over any similar patented inventions. In the course of my technical writing career, I have about eight years of patent editing experience, and I've registered a few patents of my own, so I'm quite familiar with this process. It's good to remember that just because something has been patented, that doesn't mean it's necessarily good or that the ideas in the patent description are correct. Next in the hierarchy, at the four o'clock position on our image, are conference proceedings, which are collections of presentations written by researchers who have previously delivered them to an audience at a conference, either in person or online. Presentations included in published conference proceedings receive more editorial scrutiny than patents or unreviewed biosequence data, and they can be a useful resource for your own research. You could consider them the lowest level in the hierarchy of actually formally published and reviewed, but not peer-reviewed, scholarly work. However, although such work must meet certain criteria for inclusion in the conference, it does not receive the same extent of formal and rigorous review as other scholarly publications. Conference presentations are typically accepted for inclusion on the basis of their abstract, a brief summary of their content and relevance, together with additional explanatory correspondence from the author. Conference proceedings have a shorter publication cycle than scholarly journals and a much lower barrier of entry for authors, so they are a useful way for researchers to start getting their work out into the academy and presenting it to other scholars who are knowledgeable in the field. So conference proceedings can provide you with an idea of current work and trends in specific areas of research. Nevertheless, it must be noted that conference organisers often do not require presentations to be submitted for review prior to delivery at the conference. 
So the final work may be delivered to the audience by the author or a representative without having been reviewed or even seen by the conference organisers. It is very likely that the work will be scrutinised at the conference when it is presented, and conference attendees may question the author and examine the work to some extent, but this is not the same as a scholarly journal's formal peer review process. Consequently, this kind of work, even when it has passed through a basic academic editorial process and been published after the conference in a collection of conference proceedings, has typically not received scholarly peer review and cannot be relied on in the same way as an academic journal article which has passed through a complete scholarly peer review process. There are some exceptions to this. Some conferences will arrange for the presentations delivered at the conference to be sent to the conference organisers for a formal peer review process in order to assess whether or not they are suitable for inclusion and publication in the conference proceedings. In my own research, I typically cite conference proceedings very sparingly, and I take care not to rely on them as individual sources of information unless they've been peer-reviewed. I've given a few presentations at a couple of academic conferences myself, though neither conference published proceedings, so I'm familiar with the initial submission and review process, as well as the process of delivering conference presentations and fielding questions from the audience. However, I'm also very familiar with the fact that conference presentations may not be of particularly high quality. In fact, during one conference I attended, I had a member of the conference board apologise to me privately during one presentation due to his disappointment in its lack of quality and complexity. He was concerned that the presentation might reflect poorly on the organisers, but I assured him I was well aware that conference content can be very uneven, and it really wasn't an issue to me. In any case, I wasn't really in a position to judge the presentation myself since it was outside my own area of knowledge, so I had no cause to complain. Next in the hierarchy, at the five o'clock position on our image, are technical reports, dissertations and theses. These works are typically all distinctly higher quality and far more rigorously reviewed than conference proceedings. They must satisfy specific criteria, such as demonstration of an original contribution to research in the field and demonstration of a certain level of academic knowledge and competence on the part of the author. These works have been submitted to a referee process, meaning they will have been examined by specialists in the field. Dissertations and theses will, ideally, have been seen many times by the author's academic supervisor, although that does depend significantly on the quality of the advisor. As a result, these works have been through an academic review and editorial process of some kind. However, even when they are given their final refereed review at the dissertation or thesis defence, when the author must present their work before a panel of academic specialists for examination, the author knows the identity of these specialists and they know the author. In fact, one of the referees will be the author's dissertation or thesis supervisor. Consequently, this is not the far more rigorous, complete, double-blind peer review process used by scholarly journals. Successfully defended dissertations and theses are typically made available publicly online, but even if they are published virtually on a university website in this way, this still doesn't qualify them as peer-reviewed publications. Nevertheless, because they have been produced through an academically scrutinised process and reviewed by expert knowledge specialists, they should, and I am leaning heavily on that qualification, so let me say it again, they should, but do not always, exhibit the kind of academic rigour you could expect from a peer-reviewed publication. Occasionally, a dissertation or thesis may be converted into a proper academic publication, such as a monograph, a single-volume book on an academic topic. This may even be printed by the university press. During this process, it will be subjected to further editorial review, though again, not necessarily full peer review. Sometimes dissertation or thesis content will be extracted and submitted as individual articles for publication in a scholarly journal. If this happens, then those articles themselves will most likely be peer-reviewed, depending on the journal's policies and levels of rigour. 
at that point, the articles derived from the work can be considered peer-reviewed, though not the complete original work itself. I have never written a dissertation or thesis myself, though I have been a secondary advisor and editor of quite a few. I would rather cite a dissertation or thesis than conference proceedings, though if the dissertation or thesis contains original research, I am always cautious about it because it hasn't yet been scrutinised by peer review. However, dissertations and theses often contain a literature review, which is an assessment of the current scholarship of the field, typically organised chronologically, explaining how key research questions, findings and contributions have emerged and how they have been received by other scholars in the field. A literature review is very useful. It's like an annotated bibliography or list of references describing important works you can use to investigate the topic further. It's a great start for your research. Sometimes a dissertation or thesis will contain useful original work which you might be able to verify yourself if the author provides sufficient evidence and citations, and in that case, you can definitely use it with confidence. Very often, these works will cite a wide range of literature, so you should find their reference lists very helpful. Finally, right down the bottom, at the six o'clock position on our image, we have journal articles. These are academic works which have been submitted for proper peer review before being accepted for publication. There are a few useful terms to learn here. For example, you might see a journal referred to as an academic journal, a scholarly journal, a refereed journal, or a peer-reviewed journal. Generally speaking, academic and scholarly are synonyms, refereed and peer-reviewed are synonyms, and journals referred to as academic or scholarly have typically been peer-reviewed. Peer review means a publication has been scrutinised for accuracy and quality by at least two reviewers who have expert knowledge of the topic. They read articles submitted to the journal and write comments for the author, advising whether or not they believe it is publishable in any form and providing details of any changes necessary to ensure publication. The author responds to this critique and resubmits the article for further review. Depending on the journal, staff members and other factors, this can take weeks or it can take months. Sometimes it takes over a year. I've been fortunate to have a couple of articles published in scholarly journals after just two rounds of peer review, taking at least six months. Peer review takes place in one of two ways, single blind or double blind. In this case, blind means hidden. Single blinded review means reviewers' identities are hidden from authors, giving reviewers the confidence to provide unconstrained feedback without risking the author holding a grudge against them afterwards if they feel unjustly criticised. Double-blinded review means reviewers' identities are hidden from authors and authors' identities are hidden from reviewers. The aim is to provide reviewers with the same freedom as under single-blind review while additionally reducing the possibility of reviewers being influenced negatively or positively by knowing the author. Maybe the author is very well known and respected, in which case the reviewers may treat their work with unwarranted deference, even unconsciously. Maybe the author is controversial or disliked personally by the reviewers, in which case they may treat the author's work with unwarranted criticism. Double-blinded peer review is considered the most effective and rigorous form of review. Research strategy now we need to organise our research strategy, and to do that we'll look at the left-hand side of our image. In two-thirds of the image, from the six o'clock position to the ten o'clock position, we can see reference to secondary sources, and in the ten o'clock position to the twelve o'clock position, we can see reference to tertiary sources. I've made a previous video explaining what these are, and you can find a link to that in the description of this video but I'll repeat a little of that content here to save you the trouble of watching that video before this one. You can see our image recommends we start at the 12 o'clock position with the tertiary sources and then move anti-clockwise looking at the secondary sources. In our image, all the sources we looked at previously, identified in the right-hand side of the image and highlighted in green, are described as primary sources because they are all original research but a more useful term for them is primary literature, the academic work in a field which generates original research. 
In my previous video, I explained how these terms are sometimes confused. In our image, the secondary sources interpret the primary literature. These secondary sources analyze and comment on primary literature, aiming to establish its validity, meaning, and significance. In our image, secondary sources are identified differently to the way you'll see them most commonly identified in academic guides, library websites, and in other research sources. This image classifies sources such as encyclopedias, handbooks, dictionaries, and yearbooks as secondary sources, whereas most guides would identify them as tertiary sources. However, it identifies treatises, monographs, and reviews as secondary sources, which is very standard. Tertiary sources synthesize and summarize primary and secondary sources, aiming to provide convenient access to the essential information in these sources with minimal effort on the part of the reader. In our image, sources such as guides to the literature and library catalogues are identified as tertiary sources, which is typical, though, as we've seen, sources such as encyclopedias, handbooks, dictionaries, and yearbooks are also usually identified as tertiary. How should you start your research? In our image, the suggested research process starts at the 12 o'clock position with tertiary sources and moves anti-clockwise, proceeding to secondary sources and then proceeding to primary sources. However, your research process should be guided by your familiarity with the subject you're researching. If you're unfamiliar with the subject, start with the tertiary sources. They should tell you the current scholarly consensus, which is what the majority of qualified professionals in the field agree on, provide an overview of the subject, and cite the most important primary and secondary sources, sometimes providing a short bibliography or reference list, which will be very useful for your own research of the secondary sources. If you're reasonably familiar with the subject, start with the secondary sources. The best and most up-to-date of these will usually be found in scholarly journal articles, since they are researched and published much faster than book-length treatments. Depending on the field, journal articles very often start with a literature review, which is very useful. Another good way to find secondary sources is to read the academic bibliographies you can find on university department websites. These reference lists have been prepared by specialists in the field, typically by professors or other academics, who have collected and curated them specifically for use by their students, so they're a reliable way of discovering good quality secondary sources. If you're investigating a subject on which you have plenty of knowledge, you could start directly with the primary literature. You probably already have a good idea of which secondary and tertiary sources to use to check your understanding and analysis. In subsequent videos, I'll present methods for checking the reliability of individual sources. How do you know if a book or journal article you're reading is a good source of information? How do you know which scholarly journals are trustworthy and which are predatory content mills, or have poor review and quality management practices. Check the video description for a link to one video I've already made on this topic, and a link to a page on my website providing links to many freely available primary, secondary, and tertiary sources, including many free online scholarly journals.